that kind of led me, you know, on, on this path that eventually led to a 25 year sentence in, in prison when I was 22 years old, you know, I was getting like 10, you know, 25, 50, hundred pounds of marijuana at a time when I was like 16, you know, and the same with LSD, you know, but like, like yeah. I say, I mean, I, I got hammered. I, I got 25 years, but you know, I didn't fuck around either. You know, I took off. I, I was a fugitive for two years. You know, I, I, I met this woman and now, you know, like we've been together for 28 years. You know, she did the whole 21 years with me. You know, she didn't even know my real name until the U.S. Marshals told her. So based on what people said you dealt and what you were selling, you got 25 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I never got caught with anything. Other people How? got caught with How? That was mine. How? I, I don't get that. I made white boy because I wanted to get white boy Rick out. I'm making this Humboldt County, you know, tangled roots because I want to shine a light on what is going on in the industry. Because really, to me, it's like a it's like a culture versus industry thing. If you if you got arrested, arrested for being the kingpin, the kingpin of the Ecstasy Arizona network. Do you think you'd do six years and get released? Not unless you cooperated. Nothing but the Let truth. Nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Right. Thanks for coming on, Seth, my brother. It's really appreciated. Big up, Jimmy. Yeah. Without Jimmy, this wouldn't be possible. So. First and foremost, thank you very much, Jimmy Maxwell. Big up, Jimmy Maxwell in the house. Um, it's why I've got you on my platform and why I've got my platform. I like to make people aware so they can elaborate on certain things because I like to show people by example, right? So I come from the deepest, darkest place in the criminal world and I went through everything to get where I got to. And I am a man now that believes that all I want to do is create and develop the best human beings there is on the planet. Um, I want to bring out the best in every individual so they can achieve the best goals they can and never ever enter on the journey that I was on, live in any circumstances or situations similar that I was in and try and elevate their bloodlines to a different frequency of existence, right? Now, Obviously, me and Jimmy are pals and we've got the same mindset, we've got the same drive, same passion. And he's linked with some people on his journey, you being one of them. So, because our lives are so important, but yet we devalue them by meaningless acts of violence and crime. When we're young, we make mistakes and we grow up to develop into decent human beings. And it's an absolute pleasure having you on and your story, your journey, your outcomes and where you are today, mate, is that I wear this key for the key of change, trans transition and sort of life. And you're the epitome of what that key represents. You're the exact epitome of what that key represents and what I'd like you to do is share your story with my viewers like what you went through in your early years your mid years what led you through to the situations what got you incarcerated and then basically what you had to endure through your incarceration and then what you developed since you've come out where you are what you're doing and the amazing journey you're on today my brother so without a further ado this to all my loyal viewers and followers and supporters, Seth Ferenay. He is, oh, what is it, an executive director now? Executive producer? Du like writer, writer, director, producer? So all of the above. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From where we were yeah, to yeah. where we are, Seth, man. From yeah, where yeah. we were to where we are. Like, so Seth Ferenay is the man that's responsible for a lot of stuff that's come out and coming out on Netflix, past, present and future. So without further ado, Seth, introduce yourself to my viewers. Let us know a little bit about your history, where you're from, where you've been and where you're going, my brother. 
Yeah, my name's my name's Seth Ferrante. Um, you know, I was I was kind of like a, a military brat. You know, my, my dad was in the military, so we kind of moved around a lot. I, I was born in California, but I lived on the East Coast. I lived in Germany. I actually lived in England for three years as a teenager. So um, I kind of bounced all around, you know, and and really like like a lot of teenagers, you know, like like around the age of thirteen. You know, I, I, I started looking for stuff like outside my family. You know, I, I don't know. I think a lot of teenagers, I don't I don't know if it's because we get bored or we want something else or, you know, we think our family life is, you know, like lame or whatever. You know, so I, I started looking outward. You know, I, start, I started hanging out with my friends. You know, I started getting involved in, in drugs. And um, that kind of led me, you know, on, on this path that eventually led to a 25 year sentence in, in prison when I was 22 years old. So it, it was basically like that nine years, man, from the age of 13 to 22, which, you know, me and you have discussed. I mean, those are like vital years for kids, man. That's like, I mean, those years can, you know, make you or break you. I mean, they can really shape you, you know, and, and when I was 13, you know, I thought it was cool. I thought it was cool to skip school. I thought it was cool to get in fights. I thought it was cool to steal shit from people. I thought it was cool to like humiliate people, you know, to make myself feel better. Like I was a big tough guy, you know? So I, I went through all that. And, and then I got really involved in the drug scene first with just, you know, smoking marijuana, you know, taking LSD, you know, doing mushrooms, a, a little cocaine. And then, uh, you know, then I got really involved by the age of 15 or 16 where I, I was selling. You know, I became a supplier. I became a drug dealer. You know, I, not only first just to get free drugs, but then, you know, I've, I realized real quick, like, you know, not only can I get free drugs if I get the drugs, but I can make a lot of money. So by 16, you know, I kind of had this mindset, you know, that, uh, you know, and, and we're talking too, like, like I, I was, I was 16 in 1987. So, you know, we're talking like the mid eighties, you know, hip hop had just exploded. Yeah. You know, it was like that, uh, you know, that hustler get money mindset, you know, that, I mean, there was movies like Scarface coming out, you know, New Jack City, you know, all these gangster movies. And, and you know, I kind of, I glorified that stuff. I romanticized that type of stuff. You know, I wanted to be, you know, that type of person that I saw on the screen. So even though, you know, I, I was in different worlds because, you know, I was kind of like in the suburbs, you know, in the States, you know, and, and like I said, I, I was middle-class suburbs. So that, I, you know, I didn't come from poverty. You know, I didn't come from the streets. You know, I, I came from a good home. I, I came, you know, not like my parents were millionaires, but, you know, my, my parents, you know, had money. You know what I'm saying? They could buy me stuff that I needed. But still in that little suburban world, you know, I, I decided like, you know, I was going to be the bad boy. I was going to be the one, you know, that kind of called the shots, you know, and, and made things happen. You know, I was going to be like the rock star, you know, in my own mind. And I did this through becoming a drug dealer, you know, by, you know, buying, buying uh, first, you know, pounds of marijuana, you know, and, and eventually, you know, I was getting like 10 you know, 25, 50, 100 pounds of marijuana at a time when I was like 16, you know, and the same with LSD. First, I was buying sheets of acid, which is like 100 hits, you know, but eventually I was buying like what they call, you know, like, like a book, which is like 100 sheets, you know, 10 pages, 10,000 hits, you know, and I, I was getting that through uh, connections I made on the Grateful Dead tour, you know, and um I was getting that sent right, right into Fairfax County where I was going to high school in Virginia, right outside of DC. Yeah, so you had the entrepreneurial skills from an early age, Seth, man. Uh, yeah, definitely, did you man. Face much, did you face much conflict and rivalry coming up, going through schools, serving up and things like that? Was it something that... Yeah, I would say, I mean, but... I mean, really no gunplay. I mean, hardly, not even really knife play. You know, you might see knives, but not a lot of guns. I mean, because, I mean, basically it was a lot of, like a lot of little rich kids, you know? So, you know, we, we, were, we weren't we were getting down and dirty, you know, like some people did in the inner city or you know, like some of the criminal organizations. But yeah, definitely fights, man. You know, I, I used to sell at colleges. You know, by the time I was 17, and a lot of my friends from high school were going off to university. 
I would go to the university and, you know, there might be some other guys, you know, that might try to sell drugs at the university or maybe dudes who had graduated, you know, who they thought like these were these areas. And, and I, and I would come in and, you know, I, I would, you know, whatever, if I had to fight them, if I had to do whatever, you know, I didn't care, you know, what they told me, you know, that's, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't like people weren't coming with guns and knives. I wasn't in, in that type of environment. You know, it was more like, you know, university kids and, and deadheads. So you might see some fights and, and some type of conflict, but nothing like uh, like any type of uh, open gang warfare or anything like that. It, it never got that violent. Mm. Damn. So really and truly, growing up, it was more experimenting with you and you just fell into sort of surviving with that mode, right? Like, and you never went juvie hall or nothing like that, did you? No, no, in, in, until I caught that federal case, um, yeah, I, I had not been in trouble with the law at all. So, I mean, for me, like I tell people all the time, I never considered myself a criminal, you know, because I wasn't part of a criminal organization. You know, I, I didn't carry guns, you know, I didn't resort, you know, to, you know, a lot of violence, you know, other than, you know, fights, fist fights or something like that. But, uh, you know, I, I always consider myself an outlaw, you know, because I broke laws that I thought were wrong. So to me, there was always a difference. You know, it was like I, I never crossed that line, you know, because I, I was I was I was supporting stuff like like weed and psychedelics. I mean, that was my thing. So now I look at it, you know, as a 50 year old man, I, I feel really, really justified, you know, that, that the course I took because, you know, now in the states, you know, marijuana is on its way to legality, you know, in most of the states. And, you know, they're looking at psychedelics for all types of different therapeutical, spiritual and medicinal uses. Yeah, that sounds kind of amazing, but it's just what kind of baffles me more than anything, right? And it's being from such a normal, supported environment, how you actually got through your sentence. And you know what I mean? Like how you, the mindset you had to deal with, like how long did you actually spend in prison? Yeah, I did 21 years. I did 21 straight years. So Damn. I went in 93 and I got out in 2015. Wow. Fuck. Yes. Yeah. So they like hit me on the head. I mean, you know, I got 25 years when I was 22. You know, and it's really, it's because of laws, you know, they have like the federal sentencing guidelines and mandatory minimums. And um, I mean, they started like in the late eighties cracking people on the head and it was really, I mean, at first, I mean, you know, let's be honest, the laws were racial, man. I mean, the laws that they made, that this United States government made, were, were to target, you know, the inner city, uh, you know, young black males, you know, from the crack trade. So, you know, I was yeah. just like, after three or four years of that, because they started like around 88, you know, there was like criticism, you know, and people were like calling out the laws for what they were. They were saying these laws are racist. So then it was like all of a sudden, like the DEA, and the FBI, you know, they started going out to the suburbs and like, oh no, look, we bust, we're not racist, we bust white drug dealers too. So I was in that first wave of kind of marijuana, uh, psychedelic guys, you know, when they first started going out to the suburbs in 91. But you know, that was just basically, you know, to cover their asses. So, you know, but like, like yeah. I say, I mean, I, I got hammered, I, I got 25 years, but you know, I didn't fuck around either. You know, I took off, I, I was a fugitive for two years, you know, I wasn't, you know, I'm like, I'm like the type of dude, like they say, like, I, I got jackrabbit in my blood. You know what I'm saying? If the law is after me, I'm going to run. You know, I'm not going to stay there. You know, fuck them. You know what I'm saying? They're going to have to catch me. Yeah. Sick. It's kind of mad, though. Like, see, growing up in America, like, all the states, all the laws, and everything you used to be involved in. So, all the things you used to be involved in now are actually becoming legal and sort of acceptable and sort of normal now, right? So I actually get where you mean when you're saying that you feel justified in your journey and that, and it's something that I wouldn't sort of disagree with being a medicinal use, right? Because after my incident when I got shot, I only had THC, no morphine, no painkillers, nothing but THC, the drops. 
and I lived on them for 18 months with no other medication. So I know it does actually work and I never actually experienced any PTSD. Like I had one incident of PTSD, which I believe was PTSD, where I had a dream that someone walked up and shot me in my eye. But apart from that, I've had nothing similar since. Do you know what I mean? And I believe that's because of the THC that I was taking at that time, prevented the post-traumatic stress setting in. And then I continued, um, even when I come back to this country, to um, ingest the THC for medicinal reasons, you know? And I'll just hope and pray that they legalize it over here for that reason. And no, I, th I, I feel you on that. Cause look, I, I've always, I mean, I've always been a stoner since the age of 13. So, um, you know, at times, you know, I take breaks too. Cause I, I think anything, you know, it taken to the extreme, you know, is, can, can be bad for you. So I'm actually on, like I call it toler tolerance break. So I'm actually on a tolerance break right now. I'm not smoking any weed, but I'm the type of dude, like when I do smoke weed, like I smoke 24 seven. You know, I'm like a wake and bake dude. That's always been my thing, you know, like first thing in the morning. Yeah. But uh, yes, similar to you, I, I, I really think, you know, the cannabis has, uh, you know, helped me a lot. Because um, even though, look, I, I did 21 years in prison, man. I saw all types of fucked up shit, man. I saw people get their head splits, you know, people get stabbed. You know, luckily, you know, I was never involved in, in stuff like that, you know. But uh, I've, I've seen it. I've, I've witnessed it. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have any you know, PTSD or, uh, you know, I, I haven't experienced stuff like that. You know, sometimes I, I, I do have dreams where it's like, uh, like I'm dreaming that this whole life out here is like a dream. Like I'm still in, you know, it's like a dream. And like, I just wake up and I'm like still in there. You know what I'm saying? So I've had that a couple of times. Yeah, but that, that, that's kind of the worst. But you know, also what I've noticed, because I, I did such that long stretch at 21 years, it's like when I was in there, I kind of repressed the outside world, you know, I kind of compartmentalized it because, you know, I was doing time and I had to do time. I couldn't be thinking about the fucking world, you know, I mean, well, yeah, you know what yeah. I'm saying? You got to be a man and you got to do what you got to do, you know, fuck what's happening in the world, you know, fuck real life. It's only what's right in front of you. So, um, but I found since I've been out, like when I first got out, it was like I had a whole bunch of like deja vus, you know, like when I was doing things for the first time since I'd been out, even though I had done them before. You know, so it was like this weird deja vu, like, oh man, I, I did this before, you know, but it was like the first time since I've been out. But I found like the longer I've been out, it's like my life from before has connected with my life now. And so then that time in prison has like came down here in a box. And like, I got this new timeline from, you know, like Seth up to 22 and then Seth at 43 and it's kind of connected. So it's, it's, it's yeah. weird, man. You know what I'm saying? And, and all the prison, the prison stuff, yeah, I can, I can recall that stuff, but it, it's, it's come down here because, you know, and we've talked about this a lot too, um, on the phone, you know, that, that criminal mindset, man, that mindset that serves you in the streets, that mindset that serves you in prison. It, when, it, when you're out here and you're trying to do legit stuff, man, and, and you just, you know, want to be a regular citizen, that mindset does not serve you and it will only lead you back to prison. Yeah. So, I mean, for I'm not when, when I was a drug dealer, you know, I had a certain mindset. I was like, I was a hustler. I was getting money. When I went to prison, I, you know, I had a different mindset. It was like a, a convict, you know, I had a convict mentality, a convict mindset. And then when I got out, I had to, to develop a new mindset because I had to leave those mindsets behind. I almost had to evolve. And I think age has a lot to do with it too, but I, I, I really had to evolve. You know, it's like, uh, almost you know how like a snake like you shed your skin you know what i'm saying so you got to leave yeah. you got to leave that past stuff behind man if you want to change because if you try to adhere to those mindsets you know like now if i try to do that now where i'm here here and now i mean it's it's only going to lead me to, to problems it's only going to lead me to conflict it's only going to lead me you know back to prison worst case scenario yeah so you sound like you adapt to a hell of a lot, right? Because the, again, I get these questions like, I come from nothing. So going to prison to me was not, it was all right. It wasn't that bad. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, it was all right. Like, 
what was going to prison, like especially the Max Penn prisons, what was that like for you? Like, what what, what was the yeah, yeah. transition period like? What was the mindset? Like all that, like, come on, that was that's what I'd like to know because I know what it's like walking into a normal prison for the first time in England, right? But walking into a max penitentiary prison, federal in America, is a next level. So, what was that like, my brother? No, definitely for for me, it, it was culture shock because because first off, when I went in in 1993, it was 75 percent african-american the federal prisons they had filled up with black guys you know from from the crack from the crack stuff all from the crack stuff in the 80s so i mean i i walked in dude and like i, I was a minority so that was like a new experience for me because like you know in, in america in the world you know i wasn't the minority i didn't even know what that felt like so to go in there yeah. you know and to be a minority i mean that was like culture shock to me you know so that that was like the first thing and then the second thing like look I remember the first day, like they, they bring you in, usually when they would bring you in, they bring you in like after lockdown, you know, like you sit in the R&D all day, you know, they give you a little bedroll and change, you know, strip you out, all that bullshit. And then they bring you in after lockdown. So I go in after lockdown, you know, and everybody's like looking in the cells, like who's the fucking new guys, blah, 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 whatever. And I, and I go in the cell and I'm with this old, old dude. He's like a bank robber. So, you know, I get up, I get on the top bunk and then like two, you know, like in transit and shit, like they don't feed you shit. So. You know, I don't have any commissary because I'm, I'm fresh on the pound. So, you know, by 5 a.m. when they crack the doors, like, I'm hungry as fuck, right? And I'm trying to go to chow. So I remember I walked down and I'm waiting for them to call my unit. I'm waiting for them to open the doors to the unit so I can go to the chow hall, you know, and eat breakfast because I'm, I'm hungry. And I remember standing there, right? And I hear, like, this commotion, right? So, I, I you know, I kind of, like, look around or whatever. And... uh you know, there's this big dude and he's like punishing this little dude, big black dude. He's punishing this little dude. And I was like, fuck. Right. So I kind of like try to mind my own business, you know, because you're not supposed to look at shit like that, you know. So uh, whatever I go and I stand there and then like the little dude gets punished. And then, um, you know, the big dudes like stand there huffing and puffing or whatever. And then, you know, I see the little dude walking, you know, out of the corner of my eye, walking on the top tier and he's going to his cell. And what he did is he went and got a weapon. So he went and he got like a. a you know, like they call them in the feds, like it's a lock and a sock, you know? So what they do is they get like a combination lock and they put it in a sock, you know, and then they use it like a, a you know, like a flail or whatever, you know, like a, yeah. you know, like a makeshift weapon. So then this little dude comes back and I, and I catch him creeping down and the big dude's all, you know, puffing up and he cracks a big dude, you know, from the back, like on the top of his head, the big dude, you know, he had a, uh, you know, he was bald dude. And, and they just like, you know, immediately split his head open and start swelling and blood started coming out and you know to his credit for the for a minute the big dude was you know he was a little phased and uh the little dude just cracked him one time really hard and maybe he thought it was over but it wasn't over because the big dude like he had blood coming down his face and everything and he just shook it off and then he started chasing the little dude the little dude was running and eventually the little dude like ran into the seal's office you know the guard's office and was trying to hide yeah. behind the guard and the big dude trying to get him but the CO hit the deuces, you know, like the body alarm. So then, you know, like all the cops come running. And then, uh, you know, needless to say, uh, after all that, I mean, I didn't go to breakfast, man. I just went back to my cell, <laughs> jumped back in bed. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, what the fuck do I got myself into? You know, because I was like, I witnessed a violence, like firsthand, like right in front of me. Like that was literally my first prison experience. And I got worse, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Man. You know, not. luckily though, like, like, look, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not gonna front or whatever. I was, you know, like in, in the federal system, they got, like, basically, it's like a level five. That's the highest. That's like the the 24 hour max lockdown. That's like, uh, you know, what the, what they call, uh, they call a super max. I was so I was never in the super max, man. Then they got the USPs, United States Penitentiaries. That's a level four, right? Like at level four, that's like a high. They say boys fight, men kill. That's kind of, you know, I was in the medium. So I did 12 years in the mediums. That's like a level three. But, the, you know, the, I mean, they, they rock and roll there. They, they call the mediums, the level three, they call gladiator schools. Like basically, yeah, yeah, like you have to fight. Yeah, you have to fight. If you don't fight, 
your own people will turn on you. You know, and then, uh, so I spent 12 years in the gladiator schools, my first 12, and then my level dropped. My last nine, I did in Lowe's, which is like a level two. I never made it to a minimum, which is like a level one. That's like a camp, you know, like they don't even have yeah, a fence. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, you know, so I was always behind the fence. But, you know, I wasn't, like they say, like the, the, the level fours, that's behind the wall. You know, because they got like the yeah. 30 foot walls, you know, that's a high. So I started in the medium highs because really in this country, like if you were under 25 in the federal system, unless you were like a killer, they didn't put you in the highs. They started you out in the mediums. I mean, if you went to the mediums and you fucked up, you could get to the highs, you know, but, yeah. you know, I, I was pretty like, whatever, you know, I, when I had a fight, I, I, I fought, you know, but I wasn't trying to be in the mix, you know, even from, you know, that first day when I walked in, uh, I was trying to figure out like, you know, what, even though, cause I had 25 years, but there was a light at the end of the tunnel. I was only 22. I knew I was getting out, you know, by mid forties. So I was like, you know, what can I do for my future? What can I start doing now? That's going to benefit me from my future when I get out. Cause I knew there was a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, and I knew I wasn't going to return, you know, to what I already did, you know, even though, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, I fucked around with some drugs, you know, in prison. I mean, you hustle, you got to make money. I'm a hustler at the end of the day. So, you know, sometimes I did shit cause I needed to make money, but you know, I was already looking for an alternative, you know, career lifestyle, um, you know, from the day I first got in there, even though, you know, it, it, at the same time, you know, I mean, I grew up to become a man in prison. You know, I went in, I was 22. So I became a man in prison. So, you know, at the same time, I mean, you do what you got to do without, you know, trying to take it to the extreme. You know, I didn't, I didn't have to be the baddest motherfucker on the yard. You know, I just had to be the dude that motherfuckers wouldn't fuck with. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get it, man. I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. So what got you interested in sort of, what turned you to hustling? What was it like? Because you come from a stable background, right? Your family was supportive. Like, was it just a, a bit of an ego thing to get into earn extra money? Like, no, I think, you know, I, I've thought about this a lot over the years. So kind of the conclusion I, I've come to now as a 50 year old man is, you know, cause I, my dad was in the military. So we moved around a lot. So I was always like the new kid, right? So you always got to like establish yourself, like the new kid, nobody knows you, you know? So even at school, you might have to come in and get in a couple fights, you know, whatever, you got to prove who you are or whatever. So. And I always, I crave that acceptance, man. I crave that popularity. So, you know, I think I found out like around 13, you know, when I started taking drugs that, uh, you know, like if you were the guy who got the drugs, I mean, you got that acceptance and you got that popularity like real quick. So I think for me, it was really, uh, you know, it was from my, like my own insecurities from always being the new guy. So, you know, I, I had to do this to kind of gain acceptance from my peers, you know, because, you know, I, I wanted to do it quickly and, and, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be like a rock star, you know, I, I wanted, I wanted the girls, you know, I wanted to be invited to all the parties, you know, I wanted the other dudes to look up to me, you know what I'm saying? So that, that, that that's kind of like the whole thing for me. It was like an accept, ex, acceptance. See, it, I mean, I mean, the money was cool. I'm not going to say the money wasn't cool, but you know, my parents had a little bit of money. It wasn't like, I, it wasn't like, you know, I needed money, but of course, you know, I mean, the more money, the better, but, uh, you know, it, for me, it was more, it was more like a popular thing. It was more the acceptance thing, you know, and I think that's, it, it came from, you know, always moving every two or three years and always being the new kid. So it was just like my way to get in, you know, like I'm the drug guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I see, I see similar sort of attributes in slightly different ways. So the, the, the underlying factor that I've noticed with a lot of us ex-criminals is that we all wanted to belong somewhere and we all use that need of acceptance or belonging to, perpet to perpetuate us to being accepted within certain environments, right? So mine was, Yours was drugs, mine was violence. So I, I totally get it. Do you understand? I, I do get it. And then you spent 21 years in prison. And when you, before you went to prison, you were pretty educated, right? I mean, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I went to high school, you know, but I mean, I, I got to college, but I, you know, 
I was partying too much. So, I mean, college wasn't really my thing. Really, it was in, in prison where I really um, educated myself, you know, because uh, so in prison, when I first went in, they had, um, they had like in the feds, like they had college professors, like from the local community colleges or local universities would come right on the compound and teach classes at night. So immediately when I went in, I kind of found, a, a, you know, I, I kind of found a home like in the education department, you know, with, with going to these college classes. So, I mean, that's all, look, all I did in prison was basically I played sports. I was always real athletic. So I played sports and, uh, you know, I worked on college courses and then eventually I started doing, cause I was in education so much and I could type everybody would come to me like when they needed like grievances, like they'd file like grievances in the institution, you know, they, they would, I would type them up for them, you know, and then eventually I got good at it. So I started doing grievances. So, you know, but I got, um, so when I first went in, they had the Pell grants, which paid for the college courses. And this lasted for like my first two years, like maybe 93 to 95. And I got 24 credits through Eastern Kentucky university, which, you know, for a, a, a associate's degree, you need like 60 credits. So I got about half, but then they abolished them. You know, they said like, Oh, uh, you know, we're not going to do Pell grants for prisoners anymore, you know, cause it was all the tough on crime stuff over here. So they were like, you know, they didn't want to rehab prisoners. They just went to warehouses. So when that happened, I was kind of fucked. But what I did is I reached out to my, my parents and I said, look, man, you know, I took these 24 credits and I, and I got all, I had like a 3.5 grade point average, you know, like all A's, like it only goes to like 4.0. So I had like all A's and B pluses. And, you know, even though, you know, my relationship with them was kind of fucked up because all the shit I had done and I was a fugitive and stuff like that, you know, that the educational was kind of a way to mend my relationship with my parents, like saying, look, you know, even though I'm here, you know, I'm in a fucked up situation because of what I did. I'm, I'm trying to better myself. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to take this educational classes. So I asked them if they could find like some correspondence courses, you know, that I could do through the mail to continue my education. And they found me a program through uh, Penn State University. And what I did through Penn State, I actually, I got a associate's degree you know, it took me a couple of years. And, um, after that I transferred to this other program and this is, and th th you know, this is like pre-internet everything. So this is like all through the mail. Like they just mail me the books, you know, I type up the stuff and I send it back to the teachers and, you know, they write it like hand, you know, send it back to me, you know, with notes and grade my stuff. So, um, you know, if I was lucky, maybe every now and then I could get a phone call through the educational department with the instructor. So then I transferred to the university of Iowa, and I got my bachelor's degree, you know, through correspondence courses. And, and both my degrees were basically like in liberal arts, you know, like writing heavy. You know, I, I, I was getting into writing because I, I, I formed really early. I formed this idea, you know, that I wanted to be a writer because I'd, I'd read different books. I read uh, In the Belly of the Beast by Jack Henry Abbott, which is a classic prison book, you know, about a dude who was in the New York state system. He wrote this book. Um, I wrote... I read uh, Soledad Brother by George Jackson, which is another famous, you know, prison book. I read uh, Life from Death Row by Mamiya Abul Jamal, which was another, you know, famous prison book. So I was reading all these prison books my first couple of years to kind of, you know, ground myself in prison and, and see, you know, what, what stuff was like and kind of like, you know, I was taking notes from the books, but also I, I kind of saw, I was like, man, if these dudes can write from prison, why can't I write from prison? You know, so I kind of got this idea, you know, to be a writer, you know, and um, it was the idea that, you know, I, I held on to my whole bid, you know, eventually by the end of the nineties, after I'd been in, uh, you know, like seven, eight years, um, I, I enrolled in a master's degree program um, at California State University mm -hmm. through correspondence. Yeah, and I got uh, and I got a, I got my master's degree. Actually, I got my master's, and it was all film stuff, basically. You know, like they call it humanities, but I was taking like all film courses. Like I would even get like they like this was crazy. They would allow me to get movies sent in, like movies like that you couldn't even see as part of these courses. You know, so that was cool. Wow. And, yeah and and also another another thing that happened is um you know like in prison you got everybody got to have a job you know that's like mandatory you gotta have some type of job so you know i was real athletic so i always worked in the recreation department and i was a dude like i, I would keep like the stats 
you know, or, or keep the books, you know, for the scores, for like the softball, basketball, soccer games. You know, I was like the statistician or whatever. That was like my job. So as I did that for a couple of years, guys from other institutions would transfer in and they would come to me and they'd be like, hey, man, uh, why don't you guys do like a sports newsletter? And I'm like, a sports newsletter? I'm like, what are you talking about? So they would bring me like a little typed up sports newsletter from another prison that they transferred in from that would show, you know, it would talk about, it was like a little write-up on the, the sports leagues, you know, and the different guys, you know, that were doing good and, yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. So from that, you know, I, I started writing in prison. I started writing these sports newsletters, you know, so my job went from being like the stat guy compiling the stats to the guy who was actually, I was like writing little write-ups, you know, on the games, you know, the season. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would post these all over the prison, like in every unit I would be, I would go around and I had a pass for recreation. I could go post these up. So that was like really my first experience writing. And I got a lot of good feedback, you know, from my peers, you know, the other prisoners. And uh, so it, it was this, this gradual thing. So, you know, I, I'm taking the college courses and I'm educating myself and I'm learning how to write. I'm writing in prison for my peers as my job. And also I'm doing these grievances for people, you know, like administrative remedies, you know, like if somebody's trying to get a transfer closer to home or if somebody, you know, got like a, a you know, rules violation and they took their commissary and phone and stuff, you know, they would come to me and I would fight to get their stuff back. You know, I would fight to get the shot incident report overturned you know through this administrative remedy or, or grievance process and um see i played sports like and look i would be like the only white boy running ball with all the black dudes i would be the only white boy playing soccer with all the mexicans you know what i'm saying so i, I knew a lot of people from playing sports so when do these guys would see me in the library and they knew because a lot of this stuff you can't handwrite it it has to be typed up before you turn it in and they would see me and they're typing in the law library and dudes just started coming to me and they'd be like hey you know because they know me from sports they'd be like hey can can you type this up for me and so eventually i turned it from just typing stuff up to people where i was actually writing everything you know as i learned to write better and educated myself and then i was typing up and then eventually like after a couple of years it turned into a hustle you know, where like, if you wanted me to write an administrative remedy or, or a grievance appeal for you, you know, I, I could charge you like three books of stamps, which was like, you know, whatever, like 20 bucks. So it became yeah. like a big hustle for me too. So this, this was kind of how like, eh, all, this was all through the nineties. Everything was evolving. You know, I'm playing sports. I'm, I'm taking college courses. I'm writing these prison sports newsletters and I'm, I'm filing these uh, grievance and appeals, you know, like basically legal work, but in the prison legal work, not not for the courts. Yeah, yeah, sick, 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 sick. And, uh, 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 and that got you through how much of your sentence? Nine years, did you say? Yeah, that was basically like, yeah, my, fir my first, uh, my first nine, eight or nine years. And then, um, and like I say too, I was, Cause you know, prison, prison could be really racial. Right. But since I played sports, you know, I fucked with all the black dudes. I fucked with all the Spanish dudes. And of course I, you know, I fuck with all the white people cause that's my people. Anyhow, that's my tribe in there. So, but you know, by doing these administrative remedies and where it was like a hustle, like my own people, they couldn't knock me, you know, because before, like, you know, in prison, like if you're helping a black dude or you're helping a Spanish dude, your own people are, you know, your own people are the first who are going to say something. And they're going to be like, yo, why are you fucking with these dudes? Blah, 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 whatever. And I'd be like, look, dude, they're paying me to do this shit. So once I said that, I have like a pass, you know, because the same thing. If you got drugs in prison, you could sell it to whoever because it's a hustle. You know what I'm saying? But like if you're a white dude hanging out with a black dude and just hanging out, you know, then the white dudes are going to be like, what the fuck? You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. of the racial shit. But, you know, if you're selling, you can sell. I mean, money's green. So motherfuckers don't care. So, you know, that also gave me like a little leeway to what I eventually started doing with my writing because I, I did it firsthand. You know, I, I figured out, okay, well, if it's a hustle, motherfuckers can't really say shit about racial stuff. You know, and this helped me because eventually when I started writing, you know, by the, by the end of the 90s, early 2000s, you know, I started writing articles. You know, I started writing articles for outside publications, like a magazines like Vice. Uh, I started writing for a bunch of websites, you know, like about prison basketball. 
and I started writing a lot of gangster stuff. And a lot of the stuff I was writing, you know, was about African American gangsters, you know, but I was getting paid for it. So, you know, it was kind of like, okay, that's his hustle, you know, and, and I had, I would go to different compounds all the time, you know, because in the feds, they transfer, you don't stay in the same place. So, you know, you, they kind of move you around every two or three years. And uh, every new spot I would get to, like the, the white boy gangs, you know, like the Aryan gangs, like, you know, I was never in a gang. I never played that shit, man. I was like, whatever. I was independent. You know what I'm saying? But like the white boy gang, since I'm white, they would come like try to check me. They'd be like, hey, man, uh, like, why are you, you writing this shit? You know, what are you, what's up, man? You like uh, love blacks or something? You're writing this shit about black dudes, you know? And I'd be like, look, dude, I make money from this shit, man. I'd be like, when you get some heroin, you sell it to black dudes or whoever, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, oh, wait, same shit, dude. It's my hustle. Fuck off. You know, they could never say shit. That was like my whole fucking thing. Yeah, I turned it on them. I flipped it on them. Yeah, because some of those dudes, you know, no, whatever. I mean, to, to each his own or whatever. But, uh, I mean, some of those dudes ignorant, man. You know what I'm saying? Especially all that racial shit, man. People are fucking people, man, at the end of the day. But, you know, in, in jail, that's what they do. They pit the races against each other because of the scarcity of resources. It's like a control, divide and conquer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, do you meet any English people over there? Because my good friend Jimmy was over there. What year did you meet Jimmy? So I met Jimmy towards the end. So this was at uh, Four City. So this probably like, you had to be like around 2012, man, right before, you know, because he was working on getting the treaty transfer, you know, back to England. Because I think he'd already been in maybe like six or seven years. And they were yeah. shuffling him around a lot. And um, I actually met Jimmy. I met Jimmy Maxwell in the hole. I was in the hole for my writing. And uh, he was in the hole for some bullshit, you know, trying to buck the system or whatever. I don't know what he was in for, you know. But uh, he was the type of dude, you know, like, he didn't give a fuck what the cops said. He did whatever the fuck he wanted to do. So, you know, when you do that in jail, a lot of times you end up in the hole. So they, they put me in a cell with him. And, and they said... Uh, you know, they said before, like, he was refusing cellies. Like, he wouldn't take a cellie. You know, like, he wouldn't let nobody come into his cell. So, I mean, for whatever reason, maybe he, he liked the way I looked, he, you know, or he thought I looked cool or whatever, you know. So, he let me come in the cell, and we started talking. And, um, yeah, I was just in the hole with him, man. I was in the hole with him for, probably, for like, a month, man. Like, we were cellies. And, you know, we found out we had mutual friends, like, on the compound. You know, like one of my good friends, this guy named Arthur Williams was also like one of his close friends, you know, so we had this mutual friend in common. And then, uh, you know, I had lived in England, so we talked about that. And then, you know, like, like, uh, you know, you know, he, he we both like, you know, like the, the football, the soccer. So we talked about that. And, you know, I was doing a lot of writing. So I had some of my books, you know, by this time, by 2012, I'd written a bunch of books, you know, I'd, I'd probably written about six or seven books so I, I was showing him my books you know and he was interested in that and i was kind of telling him like my plans you know i, I was getting short you know I, I think at that time he had a 20-year bid and he only had about six or seven in so he wasn't halfway but he was working to get the treaty transfer to england but uh yeah i do remember they they were fucking with him pretty hard you know because you know like i like i said he, he he told whoever he didn't care if you were a cop or whatever he told you know exactly how he felt what he thought the deal was you know and the uh cops yeah. you know the guards didn't lead to that yeah 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 because they, it, it surprised me that uh he was kind of he was like a little free agent over there in the prison when he was allowed to move about and do basically what he wanted with anyone like it, it, was, it was a very, very unusual circumstances he lived in in prison do you know what i mean like he held he i sort of he earned a lot of respect in prison because as a man himself yeah. you know he's like one of them guys that he just i don't know it's all with me he, it's like a, a a brother do you know what i mean it's like an understanding he's like got an instant understanding that like, and it's like as soon as you walk in his company he just makes you feel welcome, makes you feel at home, do you know what I'm yeah. saying? So, can no, over he, there and he, emulate he's, that. He's, yeah, he's a, he's, he's a man's man. I mean, he's transparent, you know, he wears his emotions on his sleeve, you know. He 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 says he says what he means and, and he does what he says, you know. So, I mean, I mean, you know, there's not a lot of dudes like that. I mean, that really, everybody 
holds it up like they're like that but you know a lot of people aren't like that man it's 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 a very small percentage of men that are actually like that you know that that walk they yeah. talk the talk and walk the walk and jimmy maxwell is definitely one of those guys definitely without a shadow of that big up jim talk about you yeah love you loads brother and uh yeah so you and jimmy parted and then you went on to finish your sentence what happened after you got out what was the journey after you got out what was the transition like coming back out? What was your relationship like with your parents and your friends and family after being away for two decades? Yeah, well, um, you know, also I, I had this other interesting thing that factored into everything that, you know, I haven't talked about yet. But, you know, when I was a fugitive, um, you know, I, I, I met this woman. And now, you know, like we've been together for 28 years. You know, she did the whole 21 years with me. You know, she didn't even know my real name until the U.S. Marshals told her. You know, so she kind of yeah. rode with me the whole time. You know, we actually got married in prison in, in 2005. So she was my girlfriend. And then we got oh, married. Congratulations, my and, Yeah. So she's like, she's like the original ride or die chick. You know, like I, I tell people, like, I don't even say she's one in a million. Like she's one in a billion. I mean, imagine any woman, you know, doing 21 years with you. I mean, you know, that's like unheard of. That doesn't happen hardly at all. You know, most of them, like you know, are gone after. Yeah, but she stayed the whole bit with me. And, uh. So, right, you know, and, and also, like, look, my publishing house, like, all my writing, you know, doing the articles, you know, the books, you know, even the college courses, like, everything that I did in there, she was, like, the facilitator. You know, she was, like, she was, like, the one, you know, even though my parents might have paid, you know, for different stuff, she was the one that was actually doing it. You know, my parents had other kids. They didn't have time, you know, to fuck with me. You know, I, I was in prison, whatever. Yeah, they loved me. They would help me, but they had minimal time. You know, I had a younger brother and younger sister, but... You know, my girl, Diane, who, who's now my wife, Diane, she uh, she was the one who actually, you know, like devoted her time to me to make all these things that I wanted to do with my books, you know, my publishing house, you know, my website, uh, you know, all my article writing, all the college courses I took. She was the one who facilitated and devoted the time to make all this stuff happen. You know, without her, you know, I, I couldn't have done none of this stuff. So, you know, um, I had all this set up. So when I walked out in uh, January 2015, you know, I walked into a real good situation. You know, she already had a house, you know, I mean, she 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 worked professionally as a, she was actually a court reporter, you know, like a stenographer. So, uh, oh, wow. you know, she, she had a house and I just walked into a real good situation. You know, she already had my publishing house established and, and everything was set up for me, like right when I came. So I kind of hit the ground running. And uh, another another thing that I did that I think helped me a lot when I got out is, um, you know, because, look, there was no Internet when I went in. They didn't have cell phones. and You know, they had, like, those big-ass fucking 1980s cell phones, you know, when I went in. You know, like the big brick ones. Yeah, yeah. they didn't have no cell phones. They didn't have Internet. Why don't you carry? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, look, so, like, <laughs> the last two years I was in, um, I got, like, a whole bunch of books. She would order me a whole bunch of books, like, you know, like the uh, – the idiot's guide to the internet or the idiot's guide to cell phones. And, um, and I read all these books about the technology and stuff. Uh, you know, and I read them like a course book, you know, and I would like highlight stuff and like for two years, man, I probably read these books like 25, 30 times just to get myself up to speed, you know, on, on, on the technology, you know, that I didn't know about it. And still, you know, it's, it's not until you get the stuff in your hands, the phone in your hands, you know, it's so hard to comprehend. I remember I, I had this real big thing and I was even going around the prison. I was asking dudes, right? But you know, a lot of dudes in prison, they don't know about stuff like that. But, you know, I was reading about this thing like called bandwidth and like cell, cellular and Wi-Fi. And I was like, well, what the fuck is the difference? You know, cellular Wi-Fi, you know, you get you on the internet. But, you know, I, I had no concept of what bandwidth meant. Right. And, and I was going around the prison. I was asking people like, what's the difference between cellular and Wi-Fi? And it's like, nobody knew they were looking at me like I'm fucking crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, dude, why are you fucking asking us that? You know what the difference is between cellular and Wi-Fi? I mean, who asked that in prison? Nobody asked that fucking shit in prison. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, I'm curious. I'm like trying to figure it out. So, uh, you know, actually when I got out, it took me like nine months to figure it out, you know, cause it was like such a bandwidth. It was like such a foreign concept. Like, what do you mean bandwidth? So, uh, you know, finally after nine months, I figured it out. Like, you know, 
you know, like if you have to download like big files, you need more bandwidth and you need Wi-Fi to do that. Where if cellular, it's just for smaller files because it's not as much data. So, I mean, it took me nine months, but, you know, especially getting into the film work and, and all the photos and the images, you know, I kind of finally figured it out. Because, you know, if you get a big file of a picture, you know, a high resolution file and you try to download it on cellular, it's, it's going to take forever. Yeah, learning about the technology, right? So coming out of prison, learning about the technology, learning about frequencies, and the frequency that you attach yourself to led you to a specific place, onto amazing things. And do you know what? I can't actually believe, right? I can't believe that I'm talking to you, communicating with you. We're becoming friends through friends and the network of people uh, I've been introduced to so far, thanks to yourself and Jimmy, like, is I can't thank you enough because that's putting me in a different position in my country. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. what you got coming out and what's, what, even the trailers I put up the other day, the speed people I've spoken to, like, it's amazing the changes we're making for the planet in different places at the same time is amazing. So without further ado, everyone's been waiting for this bit, I think, because the trailer's next level, what you've achieved next level, what you've put out there is next level, and what's coming is next level. So I spoke to you the other day and you was at the, the California Cup representing doing cup, bits and pieces. Cup. Every, yeah, everything, like what you're doing. So if you could go back into the beginning from where the frequency and then where that led you and what you've achieved so far because it, it is i can't believe we're having this conversation knowing what you do and where you're working and what you've given me so far is more than anything i could have imagined getting in such a short space of time so thank you very much Seth, and i really appreciate everything you've done for me my brother no you're welcome but you know First off, let me say, like like they say over here in the pen, they say real recognizes real. So I mean that's 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 a credit to you and and, and who you are. So you know, like like I say, uh, I don't mess I don't mess with no jokers. I only mess with real men. So you know that that that's a credit to you. Thank and it's credit Thank to our, our mutual friend. credit to our mutual friend Jimmy because you know anybody Jimmy tells me you're a good dude, then I'm going to take that at verbatim. There's no questions asked. You know what I'm saying? It is what it is. So, uh, Come you know, on. But, That's um, what we're all about, mate. Come on. Uh, but, you know, to, to, to get back to kind of my story, so um, everything that's happening to me now, I envisioned it before I got out. You know, I wanted to make films. You know, I, I started writing in there, and, you know, I did all the books. You know, I did all the articles. Uh, but, you know, I wanted to be a filmmaker. That was that was my ultimate goal. So that was what I envisioned. You know, I started, you know, I was taking the courses. I took a lot of film heavy courses. I was reading all the books. You know, I was studying the technology. You know, I was trying to get myself to, up to speed. Not to say like necessarily like I need to shoot everything. You know, I need to edit everything or I need to do all the uh, tech stuff. You know, because, you know, there's people that have spent years, you know, studying that stuff. So, you know, I hire people like that. But I got to know what I'm talking about to some degree. You know, I just can't come in, you know, bullshit. You know, I got to have a basis, you know, like anything. I mean, if you're in the drug game, you got to have a foundation. You got to have a basis. If you're in the film game, you know, same thing. You got to you got to have a level of understanding so you know what you're talking about. First off, so you can express yourself in what you're trying to do visually. But second off, so people can't bullshit you either. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, still, in, in yeah, this world, wrong. There's a, there's a bunch of people that are always going to try to bullshit you and take your money and do nothing. I mean, that's just the way the world is, you know, a bunch of scam artists. But, uh, you know, I, I, so I came out, I came out, I had this vision, you know, and, um, I had this ambition and I had this drive and, uh, you know, I got myself in this situation where I made, I made, uh, you know, the, the, the first film, the one that's on Netflix now, white boy that I wrote and produced with Sean Reck, you know, from transition studios, you know, I brought to him, you know, it was all based on my work. And I had access, you know, most importantly, I had access to Rick, you know, and, and, and a whole bunch of other people that we used for the documentary. So um, that, was, that was like the first thing I did. And, and at that point, I knew how to tell a story. You know, I knew how to write. I knew how to put words on paper, but I didn't really necessarily know how to make a film. So um, 
you know, and God bless Sean Reck because uh, he actually took me under his wing and he mentored me in documentary filmmaking. So, you know, without him doing that, you know, during the making of White Boy, you know, I wouldn't be where I'm at now, you know, so I gotta, I gotta always, I give kudos to him because, you know, this is a, uh, this is a nighttime Emmy winning director, you know, who actually took his time for somebody who was just out of prison, you know, maybe about 18 months. And he actually, he flew me in all for the shoots. He let me sit in the director's chair. You know, he trained me and, and, and uh, mentored me in how to make films as we made White Boy. So that, that was like a very uh, satisfying you know, experience for me, because not only did I get to make a film that ended up on Netflix, I got to learn how to make films. And what was, what was, this is, is, in my brain, like, in what space of time did that happen, like? Yeah, about like, 18 months out. How so did you, like, like what, uh, when you got out of jail to, like, what, what was the... So I got out like 2015. So, you know, I got out, I was writing. I was a journalist when I first got out because, you know, from being in prison, I, I was doing a lot of writing. And, you know, another big thing, you know, I, I used to write for this magazine, Don Diva, that was real big, you know, kind of like the Outlaws Bible. I was doing all the gangster stuff. And from my work in there in prison, this uh, Vice started, I started doing a column for Vice while I was still in prison. So when I got out of prison, you know, Vice was like blown up, dude. Like right when I got out 2015, that's when like Vice Media was like blown up, turning into this big multi conglomerate. So, you know, it, it was just like another another blessing on my part. So I started writing prison columns about prison life called I'm Busted for Vice when they were just like this little uh, kind of counterculture, you know, hip trendy magazine, you know, and then they started blowing up with TV and all types of stuff right when I got out and I continued writing for him. So that's how I met Sean Rick because he had a film called a murder in the park. It was on Showtime. And what I was, I was, I was like always looking for true crime stuff I could write about for vice. So I was always looking for like new books or new films coming out. that were like kind of true crime prison stuff. And then I would go and interview the people and I would get it for vice. You know, I would do an article. I was kind of like a Q and a guy. And so uh, that's how I met Sean Reck, you know, like through my hard work in prison, writing for Vice, you know, then getting out and continuing that journalism career. Yeah, I met Sean Reck. I interviewed him for his first film, A Murder in the Park. It was on Showtime and um, he was looking for a to subject matter for a second film. And this was the same time the white boy Rick Hollywood movie with Matthew McConaughey, you know, was, was being made. And uh, I had wrote extensively on white boy rick in his case you know I, I corresponded with him we were both in prison and I, we and him had been writing back and forth for like over 10 years at this point so uh we already had a relationship and um you know all my writing was kind of geared towards you know helping him get out to pr out of prison because he was he was like another non-violent offender that had a life sentence for eight and a half kilos of cocaine so uh i pitched it to sean Reck, and sean Reck wanted to do it and i provided all the access and uh my all my previous articles and work were became the foundation of the outline for the film and um yeah man he mentored me he mentored me on that film and um really i, I learned how to make a film and just being involved in that film you know i'm, I'm, I'm really uh grateful to him and to rick you know, for allowing us to make that film, you know, to, to, to help to get him out. Cause I mean, Rick had a lot of stuff going on, man. He had big Hollywood stuff yeah. going on. He didn't have to do any of that, you know, but he did that off, off, you know, the strength of my friendship. Cause he didn't know who Sean Rick was, you know, but off the strength of my friendship, he was like, you know, he, he green lighted that, you know, and, and participated in it and, you know, um, let us make that film about him. Did that help him get out making that film or did it get released after? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, no, he got out. He did get out. I mean, I, I'm not going to say just that film. I mean, there was a big push. You know, there was a big Hollywood film, but yeah, we played a part in getting him out. Definitely, man. Yeah, wicked. You know? Yeah, I, wait, I, spoke, I spoke to him the other day. I'm, gonna, I'm waiting to speak to him in the new year. He seems pretty cool. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, Rick, that, that, that's my boy. Rick. I, I just saw him. Uh, I saw him before Christmas. I was in Detroit with, at a charity event with him. You know, he's very active in his community. He has a weed brand out called The Eighth, you know, in Michigan. So, yeah, he's been out. He's been out uh, probably, you know, going on two years right now. So he did a lot of time, man. He did like, he did 32 years straight, man. Crazy. Damn. You know, like, I, I, yeah, I did 21 straight, but that motherfucker did 32 years. But, you know, he's really, really grounded, man. Really good dude. Really humble dude. You know, and, and he deserves all, all that he has coming to, you know, all the success he has coming to him now. He deserves it all. Do you know what? The pair of you, mate, like, for doing that amount of bird, 
right? A sentence, doing that length of sentence, right? In the max and the medium penitentiaries in America, right? Amongst all the gun, like the gang, the knife and the violence, right? And to actually come out and perpetuate yourselves because everyone you've plugged me into, right? Is perpetuated themselves to a very positive place in life, very successful place in life, and have actually used their trauma to become the person they are today. And it's to be plugged into all of you is next level. Like, and the conversations I'm having with people are amazing. And it's it's nice to know that no matter what darkness people are going through, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And for England, for the beginning of this year, I'm telling you now, what I'm doing with these releases is letting everybody know there's light at the end of the tunnel. Because as you know, in England, they haven't got a longer sentences that you have in America. But people over here believe that when you go to prison, you're fucked. Your life's over. Like, and you yeah, guys no, are establishing you that it's not. And in the worst country in the world where we're from, yeah, for a criminal record of becoming successful, you're in it. Mm -hmm. So if you can yeah, become no, successful, you, you can do it. No, you're you know, proving it's, it's, that. It's what, yeah, what, what, this is what I always tell people, right? Look, it's like anything, man. Fucked up shit happens to everybody, man. And and I'm saying way more fucked up shit has happened to other people than whatever. I did 21 years, but there's way more fucked up shit that happens to people every single day. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I, I see life and, and what, yeah, and what, what I looked at, like when I was in prison, right? Like I just saw like, you just gotta let it go, man. And you gotta move on. Cause if you hold on to that shit, if you hold on to that anger, if you hold on to that pain, if you hurt up, hold on to that hurt, you know what I'm saying? You, you're just gonna be fucked up, man. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna continue through the cycle of, of violence and drugs and addiction or, or whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? So you gotta let that, that shit go. Yeah, you gotta let that shit go. And you gotta, you know, I, I always say like in prison, I was the type of dude, I kept it moving. You know, I didn't get involved in all the drama. I didn't go, you know, if I had to address something as a man, yeah, I addressed it. You know, if, if someone disrespected me, I punched him in the fucking face. You know, you got to do shit like that. But other than that, man, I keep it moving. You know, I'm not harboring no bees. I'm not trying to go fucking stab somebody or be like, oh, like, even if I got in a fight with somebody and they beat me up, dudes would be like, oh, you got to go stab him. Why well, got to go stab? It was one on one. He beat me up. He got me. Whatever. I can accept that as a man. You know what I'm saying? And the dude who I fought. He's going to know, he's going to accept that as a man too. Oh yeah, well maybe he got off on me, but you know, whatever, I fought. You know what I'm saying? So that, you know, that's what, that's what fucking counts. He knows if he's going to come yeah. back to me, yeah, maybe I asked, but it's going to be a fight. I'm going to fight. And you know, anytime in a fight, dude might be able to beat your ass nine times out of 10, but there might be that one time, dude, you fucking get him. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. how, that's how fighting goes. That's how fighting that's goes. How Anybody who's been in fight, that's how goes. you know, so. You know, just because you beat somebody dude's ass one time don't mean you're going to beat his ass again. You know, they get that one fucking punch, you're out. So, you know, I was all these times, dude, I, I didn't hold on to that shit, man. And I didn't play into that shit. Like, somebody beat me up, dude. Ah, you got to go stab him. Why you got to go stab him, man? Whatever. We fought. He beat my ass. So what? You know? And then if motherfucker tries to say shit, I'll say, okay, you can fight me, motherfucker. I'll beat your ass. And you're trying to tell me I got to go stab somebody. <laughs> Fuck you. You know what I'm saying? The fuck yeah. are you? Fight me then. You know? But, uh... Yeah, so I always say, man, you got to keep it moving, man. You got to let go of the shit, man. Whatever it is that fucked you up, you got to let it go and you got to evolve and you got to move forward. And that's kind of how I live life and that's how kind of what I've done. And it, it's enabled me, you know, to get to the point now. And um, so basically, you know, after White Boy, you know, I, I'm very prolific, man. I got a ton of books out. I got like 24 fucking books out that I wrote, mostly in prison. You know, I got like comic books, you know. Uh, I got all types of shit, man. I'm just prolific. I made a whole bunch of little short films on YouTube and video appearances on you, my YouTube channel, like when I first got out, you know. But uh, then, you know, I got to the point, like after I met White Boy, I was like, you know what, man? I like to do real high production, like cinematic type shit, you know, because eventually that's what I'm going to move into, like features, like like motion picture movies, you know, like what they call narrative scripted. But, you know, right now, you know, I'm, I'm still doing this true crime documentary stuff because I'm getting a lot of play and really uh, like White Boy has opened a lot of doors to me because, you know, I had all these different ideas, you know, for all these different uh, projects I wanted to do. But, you know, with film, you need money. Right. So at first, you know, I, I couldn't get any money for a lot of these projects I wanted because you know who was I I was like nobody you know I was just this ex-con you know wannabe filmmaker that came from prison you know that wrote a bunch of fucking gangster books 
you know? So uh, people were like, okay, we're not going to give you any money. You don't have any track record. But then, boom, White Boy goes on Netflix. It fucking blows up. You know, it was like top 10 on Netflix for like two weeks. It had like 20 million views last April and May. It was almost weird because it was the end of the pandemic. So it's almost like, uh, I call it like the Tiger King effect. You know what I'm saying? Like the same, like Tiger King blew up. So we, we got the benefit of that effect. And that then as soon as it blew up, you know, then everybody started coming at me, you know, like, what else you got? You know, what do you want to do? And they want to start investing in me. So that's enabled me to kind of, uh, you know, take the ball and, and run with it. And I got all these amazing projects. You know, I got the, the one that you shared on your on your Insta story. Uh, you know, that's a tangle of roots, you know, the true story of Humboldt County which is, um, it's going to be a four-part docu-series, you know, and it's going to tell the whole story of Humboldt County. And th this is for all the, the, the weed heads out there, man. Like, if you want to know why cannabis is legal in the States, it's because of these one group of outlaw growers from this area in Northern California up in the mountains called the Emerald Triangle. So for the last 50 years, since like the early 70s, these people have been growing marijuana, you know, they've been getting busted, you know, they've had like, you know, helicopters, the area's been militarized, the DEA's gone in there, you know, but like these outlaw growers, you know, like these, these hippie cowboys, like up in the hills, like they just said, fuck the government. They said, fuck the government. We're going to keep going. We, we don't give a fuck what you do. And like these people were put under a tremendous amount of scrutiny, man. Like they militarized. I mean, this is like a, a small area, like three, tr three counties in Northern California, they call the Emerald Triangle, right? Um, you know, Mendocino County, Humboldt County, and Trinity County. And in the 90s, at one point in the 90s, 65% of all the fucking marijuana in the United States was coming from these three fucking counties. I mean, so it's just incredible. Wow. And like law enforcement was like crazy, dude. It's like, like the only thing you can compare to it is like, everybody knows like, like uh, the, the Medellin cartel or the Cali cartel in Colombia, right? And like, think like you've seen the news reports, like how much pressure the United States government put on these areas to try to break these cartels, you know, and they eventually did break them, you know, the same amount of pressure was applied in Northern California and Emerald Triangle. But look, these motherfuckers never broke, dude. They never fucking broke. They didn't give a fuck. They took all their crops. They took their property for forfeiture laws. They sent these motherfuckers to prison. I mean, these dudes are like the fucking most hardcore, straight fucking outlaws. You know what I'm saying? Like up in the fucking hills, dude. Like, dude, like when you go out there, it's like you go on your GPS and it says like, okay, uh, dude's house is like 10 miles, but it's all like dirt roads, like up mountains, dude. It takes like an hour to go 10 miles. You know what I'm saying? Cause you're like going up on these fucking crazy windy roads, like straight up, like, like you gotta have four wheel drive. Like you can't even go up on a regular fucking car. You can't even fucking get up there. So that's where these people are from. Like they grew up there. They're like multi-generational. They call them like legacy farmers, dude. Like I give the biggest kudos to these people. You know, I first knew about, uh, you know, Humboldt Bud, like in 1985, when I first started smoking weed, you know, cause their weed started creeping out. They grow the best weed in the world there. It's all sun grown, it's all organic. They got the best strains. Like their strains go back, you know, like, like they said in the early seventies, like some of the farmers from that area went over to the Middle East and they brought back like the, the original Kush seeds. You know what I'm saying? From like the Middle East, yeah. man. And they brought those and they, they bred them and so, now they're, they're strains, man. They call them heirloom strains, right? And these are like, they, they've been bred, like they're like, you know, 25th, 30th generation that they've been breeding these seeds year in and year out. So yeah, they just got the best weed, man. They got the best growing techniques. It's really, it's like, it's like the Napa Valley of cannabis, this area, you know? And so um, this four-part docu-series, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the history, you know, I'm looking, you know, it would, these areas originally settled, they call them back to the lander. So it was a bunch of hippies from the sixties who just wanted to fuck off. You know, they were like, fuck yeah. society, you know, and, and they went out and they formed these communes and they grew all their own food, you know, and they didn't even grow the, go there to grow weed, but you know, they didn't have a lot of money. So they grew, they built their own homes. They grew all their own food and they just planted weed because they like to smoke weed, you know, and it, it transformed in, into this thing, like this magical, mystical place you know for for marijuana like a marijuana mecca you know that grows the yeah. best weed in the world. and so the docu series it, it shows that whole story like why they went there it shows how they blew up in the 80s 
you know, then it shows like how the, uh, you know, as soon as they started getting a lot of money, you know, how the area got militarized and the DEA was going in there all the time. And then it goes into like the medical marijuana and the green rush. And then it goes all the way up till now, like Prop 64 and legalization in California. And it shows how nowadays, like these guys that champion this plan and made all the sacrifices, they're the ones getting fucked because in this country, as big business and big pharma moves in, they squeeze out the little guy. You know, that's just a way of capitalism, right? So it's like all these dudes, you know, because look, they grow on these little 10,000 square feet. You know, they might have 40 acres and they, they grow on the side of the mountains, basically. But now in California, like all these big pharma and, and big businesses come in and they have these big greenhouses, you know, like down in the valleys, like in all the agricultural areas, you know, and they just grow like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants at a time. You know, so what they did, they've driven the, the price down. So like back in the early 90s, the late 80s, these farmers up in the Emerald Triangle, they were getting like four or five grand a pound. Now, since legalization and all these big business and big pharma coming in and making these big greenhouses to grow everything, they push the price down to like $500 a pound. So these guys up in the hills that started all this, like they're barely surviving. So that's really what this docu-series is, is about. It's like, how can the people that champion the plan, how can the people that made all the sacrifices now that it's legal, they're like being frozen out of the business. It, it just, it fucking pisses me off, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm the type of okay. dude, anything I gotta be passionate about. I made white boy because I wanted to get white boy Rick out. I'm making this Humboldt County, you know, tangled roots because I want to shine a light on what is going on in the industry. Cause really to me, it's like a, it's like a culture versus industry thing. You know, which happens a lot in the world and especially in America, you know, people create a culture and then people want to capitalize on that culture and turn it into the industry and the people who started the culture in the first place get fucked because everybody else mm. makes money off of their culture. So that's what's pissing me off. So I'm trying to show the world because I want people in England, I want people in Germany, you know, I want people all over the world to be like, you know, when, when, when marijuana goes international and, and all the you know, stigma goes away and, and it's legal everywhere. I want people to be like, you know, I want to smoke humble, bud. you know, just like yeah. the people want good wine, they want the wine from Napa Valley or they want the wine from the, the vineyards in France. You know, if people want really good beer, you know, they want, they want the lagers from England or they want the lagers from Germany, you know? So the same thing when people want really good cannabis, they should know they uh, that's why i'm making this film i want them to know if you want to smoke good cannabis you want this cannabis from humboldt county and the emerald triangle in northern california because this is the best grown weed with the people that know what they're doing and the best strains unbelievable um, and when's when's that when's that documentary coming out so so we should be done editing probably by the end of the summer so probably next fall i might have next some fall, yeah. before yeah, I might have some sneak peeks before. I might do like a preview or I might show the first episode this spring, you know, at an event or something. I might have a premiere. But yeah, the whole thing, the whole four-part series, it's going to be four 45-minute episodes. So it'll be done by next August. And then uh, then I'll find like, uh, you know, um, I can't say Netflix because I don't know what Netflix is going to be buying next August. So, you know, I don't have no overall deal with Netflix. So, you know, I, I'm independent. So I just make stuff. And then when I make it, then I sell it. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So what projects you got coming up after the Tangled Roots now then? Have you got other things in the pipeline? Oh, so I got this, uh, yeah, I got yeah, I got a bunch of others. I got I got this one called Nightlife. Um, I actually just sent you the teaser for that um, at the beginning of this conversation, but it's about uh, it's about the violence in North St. Louis. You know, it's, it, it kind of stems off Ferguson and the whole Black Lives Matters movement. So uh, it's about this one guy, he, he's a, a Reverend Kim McCoy, and he actually walks the streets of the most dangerous parts of St. Louis on the north side at night from like uh, on Thursday, Friday and Saturday nights, like all the hot spots from like 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And he's, he's a violence interrupter. But, you know, he also, you know, he tries to get the addicts into rehab if they want to go, you know, he gives people food, you know, like oranges, you know, um, he gives out clothes you know, socks, underwear to like the homeless people, you know, stuff like that. You know, he, he just basically, you know, he's on a mission to save his community, you know, from poverty and drugs and violence. So I got that documentary, it's called Nightlife. That's like a feature doc. And uh, 
I'm working on these two other docu-series. One, it's about LSD. It's going to be called Psychedelic Revolution. So it looks all the way at the, the history of LSD, like from when it started, you know, all the way to now, you know, and how, you know, because yeah, that's LSD. That, one... I was going to say, LSD got started by the government doing, um, from, my, from my knowledge, it was for, um, for war purposes. They, 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 they developed it as a... As a something to do with the war yeah, no, they, or... they did they did they studied it yeah but it was actually it was it was discovered it was made by this chemist named albert hoffman in uh, germany for this company called sandoz he was a swiss chemist so it was first synthesized in 1948 right but then a lot of the governments in the 50s got a hold of it and and they were trying to use it as like a true serum or you know to try to get information you know they oh they had a program called like mk mk ultra over here so uh they tested like on a lot of prisoners so um but then in the 60s it was actually you know they was being studied for like therapeutic uh spiritual and medicinal value but then you know after the summer of love in 67 and you know everybody's going to concerts and tripping on acid they made it illegal so there was like this big you know 50 years of uh darkness for lsd where it's been underground you know, and that's like my case. I had an LSD case. You know, I did 25 years for LSD and cannabis. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been heavily associated with, like, the Grateful Dead. And it's really only been recently, like, where there's been, like, this, uh, uh, this you know, kind of uh, coming out again where they're doing a lot of studies, you know, like a renaissance, you know, for, for yeah, psychedelics yeah, yeah. and LSD, so, you know, which kind of led the way. I never asked you before, right? But how much fucking LSD did you get nicked with to get 25 years? Uh, like, I don't know. They said I did like uh, 100,000, over 100,000 hits. So, yeah, that's like that's 100 books. No, 1,000 books. Yeah, 1,000, yeah, 1,000 books, yeah. And how much weed? So like a hundred. Uh, I didn't get busted with any. I only got busted with maybe like 20 pounds. But, you know, see, it's a conspiracy over here. So it's what people said, you know. I mean, they, they were saying that I was doing like 10,000 hits a month for like three years. And, uh, you know, they were saying that I was selling like, you know, over 100 pounds of weed a month. So it's all, you know, it's conspiracy laws over here. So it doesn't even matter what they catch you with. It just matters what the cooperators say. Wow. So based on what people said you dealt and what you were selling, you got 25 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I never got caught with anything. Other people how, got caught with how? shit. It was mine. How? 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 I don't get that. <laughs> That's conspiracy laws. What? That's yeah. fucked. Well, so yeah, if I yeah, turn around to the police and I say, I ain't being funny, see Seth Ferenti, yeah? He just sold me four kilos of coke last week. They'd come and arrest you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. If they want me, yeah. I never knew that. that. Yeah. No, you could, get, you could get busted with four kilos and then you could say, I sold it to you and then I get the charge and you get off. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Everything simple. is based on co Yeah. Everything's based on cooperator testimony. They don't do no investigation over here. It's all wow. based on informants. Do you know what? Yeah. That's how it's going over here now. Yeah, man, I'm telling you. They're doing you. that here now. They're doing it here now. Fucking and crazy. they're frightening people now with sentences and giving them deals and 30%, yeah, Same 50 thing they did in the States, same of, thing. Operation. Like, like all, the dudes, all the dudes on my case, they went and threatened them with like 10, 20 years and they all snitched. You know that's how they do wow. it, man. They're they're following uh, America's war on drug models. So unless unless you're doing the, the 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 twenty years and the thirty years and all that sort of stuff, you basically cooperated in America. Uh, I mean, it depends on your charge. Like if you get a gun charge, a gun charge is like five years. But yeah, if if you got drugs and you got a conspiracy, conspiracy. So if if, 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 you, if you if you if you got arrested, arrested for being the kingpin. The kingpin of the ecstasy arizona network do you think you'd do six years and get released not unless you've cooperated okay okay yeah, yeah.
because any conspiracy, I actually, conspiracy I actually, I've actually heard of a, yeah. an ecstasy kingpin. Yeah, they got arrested in Arizona. They was doing parties for 10,000 people. Yeah, they was having houses. They was in with the Mexican mafia. And uh, he got six years in prison. And then he got released. He got picked up. Well, he got released and then he got picked up by his mum and dad. And he's posted that after six years, he was released. Yeah, I mean, any conspiracy in the States is 10 years to life. And it's a mandatory minimum 10 years to life. So if you got a conspiracy charge, it's a mandatory minimum 10 years to life. The only reason way you can go under 10 years is if you cooperate. So, you know, yeah. that's pretty much that's pretty much how it's been like the last uh, since the war on drugs started, like, you know, here, like in the mid 80s. So that's Damn. pretty much how, how it's been. Yeah, you know, and, so everyone who gets out, everyone, everyone who gets out relatively quick in America has, has um, done a plea agreement. Yeah, I would say, I would say, yeah, the majority. I mean, you know, you could do, you could do a plea for like a gun for five years. You know what I'm saying? Or, or if you just got like a possession. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm talking, a I'm talking charge. specifically for a reason. I'm talking specifically for a reason because, um, yeah, it's Jimmy's Jimmy. But there's been someone in England that's been pretending to be Jimmy. And I just wanted to make sure that what I thought was right and what I know is right. Yeah. And both are the same thing. It's all, it's all the it's paperwork, over. though. The, the thing, hey, the thing about uh, cases over here, you can access anybody's case. You know, they got like, like legal, you know, like legal banks. I mean, you might have to pay a subscription fee. Like when you're in prison, we had access to the thing to Lexus Nexus, so that's how they know when motherfuckers are hot. Because you can go right on Lexus Nexus and you can find out. You know what I'm saying? So dudes like talking this, you just get the paperwork. Everything in American prisons, it's all based on paperwork. You know, it's not based on like, you know, oh this dude, did, did. you, you got to have the paperwork. You can't even call somebody a snitch until you got the paperwork. You yeah. know, because every but you can get the paperwork from the courts, man. It's it's really really easy to get the paperwork over here. So once you got, I mean, the paperwork doesn't lie, man. It's Black that's what white. they that's what they say right? they say look dudes can say whatever they want but the paperwork doesn't lie <laughs> you know what i'm saying amen to that amen to that so after that you you've got the um was it the, what the, something dark was it dark nights oh no i got this other one called it's called uh nightlife that's nightlife the nightlife nightlife yeah yeah yeah, and then I got I got the uh, psychedelic revolution. That's the one on LSD. That's going to be a three part docu series, and then I'm I'm doing this other docu series on the mafia and heroin. It's called Dope Men. So that's going to be a three part series. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So all this stuff's going to start to drop. Drop. All this stuff's going to start dropping this year or two twenty twenty two. Sick, sick, yeah. Sick. So, uh, who knows? Maybe, 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 maybe by the end of the year, I, I might, I might be uh, somebody worth talking about. But definitely without a shadow of a doubt. If it's got anything to do with me with Seth, I'll be yeah. shouting you from the rooftops next week, brother. Yeah, we'll see. And then, like I say, if, if, yeah, um, you know, everything goes, everything goes according to plan this year. Then, uh, you know, by by 2023, you know, I want to I want to start doing like movies. I want to start doing like fictional narratives. You know, because it's really that's my goal. I tell people all the time. You know, I want I want to be like the next Quentin Tarantino. You know, I'm not fucking around. I'm trying what? to do big budget big movies saying that saying that i'm going to need a co-producer and a co-director and a co-writer to write my movie and i've reckon between me and jimmy and a couple of other people we've got decades and decades of movies seth decades no, definitely decades man that's what hey that's what yeah. i love i love hey, i love the gangster drug dealer shit. that's my that's my genre yeah Love, I love Guy yeah. Ritchie too. Guy Ritchie's another. I love Guy Ritchie. Yeah, come on. You know, well, we were, a, we, were a, we were the drug dealer armed robbers and nutcases. Gangsters. It's yeah. crazy. So, yeah, there's going to be a, a whirlwind of movies. I, I mean, there's a lot of out. movies out there. there. Hey, there's a lot of movies out there. But look, dude, the, the best people to tell these movies are the people that actually experience these lives. These, you know, that led these lives, you know. A lot of movies based on this guy or based on that guy but you know like like, like i say man when you, when you get the people 
that actually led led the life and you got the people on the production side that actually led the life. I mean, the movie's just gonna be so much better. You know, I'm not, I'm not knocking. I mean, there's some good movies out there. So you've led an amazing journey. You've done amazing things. You've got amazing outcomes. You're leading, the, driving the force in changing the narrative for the humble county weed growers. And you're making steps in the right direction to become an international producer, director, writer, um, for series, movies, and everything else. And I'm glad that I've met you. I'm glad I know you. I'm glad I'm going to get to know you a lot more. And I can't wait till we meet and hug and say, yes, my brother. So I have to thank you yeah. for coming on. I've got to thank you for all the connections you've given me. And I'm thanking you for the opportunity to enter into America with your network and grow. Yeah, no, no problem, bro. Like I said before, real recognizes real. And um, look, all, all of us, man, that have gotten out of life and, and, and moved on to something better, man. I, I say, look, we did everything we did. We, we succeeded in, 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 a, in a harsh life under dire circumstances, you know, but now, now it's time to do it the right way. Because like I say, man, I'm not knocking anybody that's doing anything, but I mean, to be where we've been and, and do what we've done and gone through what we've gone through, I mean, we and come out the other end and we're still alive and we're not doing life in prison. I mean, it's time, dude. We can do whatever we want, man. So that's what I'm saying. That's why, you know, all my friends, I got a lot of friends, ex-cons, ex-criminals, whatever. We're in the entertainment industry now. And, uh, you know, this has put the world on notice. You know, we're coming to take over, not only in the U.S., but in the U.K. too, and in that internationally. You know, we're all allying up. This is what's up. That's what's Ain't happening. no joke. So Nothing but the let, truth. Nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. So enough about the truth. Let my viewers know where they can reach at hashtags or apps or all your social media platforms. You want to tell me them? I'll put them up in the description as well. But yeah, so look, you can follow me at Seth Ferrante on Instagram and Facebook. That's S E T H F E R R A N T I. Uh, also, I got my website is Gorilla Convict G O R I L L A C O N V I C T dot com. Also, also sethferrante.com. You also get to that same website. You can see my blog. You can order my books. You can see, you know, uh, teasers for my upcoming films. And uh, yeah, basically everything about me, even when, when this comes up, you know, I, I'll put the link to this up there too. So I got all my latest, you know, press up there. So it's, it's a pretty interactive website that's kept very up to date. Well done. And um, thank you very much once again. And if you ever thought that committing crime or being convicted of a crime or going to prison is the end of your journey and the end of your life, then you're mistaken because we are proving by leading by example that changing the narrative, working hard, committing to your goals, staying driven to your vision of success and positivity will greatly be rewarded with success. And Seth is living proof of that, you know, 21 years in max penitentiaries, medium penitentiaries to come out and actually educate himself throughout the system to come out and actually lead a law abiding lifestyle in the frequency of terrestrial telly and international global sort of movies, you know? So it was an honor and a pleasure to have you on Seth and you're going to inspire a lot of my youngsters to actually get into the film world and the, um, the producing, directing and writing because it, it, it's like you said, real recognises real and no one can tell the stories better than the real people. So if the real people have got a skill to put what they have in their mind onto paper and into tape, then you're living proof that it's possible, my brother. So thank you again for coming on. Nothing but the truth from Marvin Herbert. Stay tuned, stay focused and stay positive. Upcoming international in three weeks. Speak soon. Stay safe, stay focused, stay positive. Lots of love and light from Marvin Herbert team and the rest of the world. Lots of love and light. Speak soon. Stay safe, stay focused, stay positive.